Hello, today we're here, we're going to talk about the cell membrane. As you can see, some of these structures we've already discussed. The things with the blue heads and the two tails, those are phospholipids. If you remember back to September, we talked about our four major organic macromolecules for carbs, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. One of those types of lipids was a phospholipid, which is the main or primary component of cell membranes. Other things in here are cholesterol. See these yellow things here, they had fluidity. These channel proteins which you see here and here. You have signaling or marker proteins around. And then down here are other things. This is the cytoplasm, and these things here are cytoskeletal, cytoskeletal filaments. So they're not really part of the cell membrane, but they do attach underneath and go across the cell to the other side to give it like a springy skeletal, helps the cell maintain its shape. So let's begin. Cell membrane separates the living cell from its non-living surroundings. Remember, of all the criteria of life, one of which is that all living things are made of cells. So how can you tell where a cell is or what constitutes a cell versus something that's not? Well, it has to have a membrane or a barrier to separate it from the non-living extracellular world. All right, this barrier controls traffic into and out of the cell. It'll let some things in really easily. Other things have to go through via a protein channel or something like this. Other things can get out easily or have to be pumped out manually or with using energy of some sort. Because of this, we say it's selectively permeable. That means it allows some substances to cross the membrane more easily than others. So think selective is picky or choosy, and permeable means it has holes, like something like permeates or is permeable. So selectively permeable means just that, allows some substances to pass more easily than others. And remember, it's made of phospholipids, proteins, and other macromolecules, as in you know, cholesterol, things like that. So they form a bilayer. By bilayer, we mean it's one, two-sided. You can see here in a cell, this looks like a basketball, but a cross-section is cut out. There's water inside and outside. Remember the inside, mainly watery substance, the cytoplasm. Outside is just, you know, interstitial fluid or whatever. This lipid bilayer all throughout, you can see here, the outside and inside love water. Those are those hydrophilic heads. The inside here hates water. Those fatty acid or hydrophobic tails turn in on one another. They do this because it's almost as if it's a deal they work out. It's sort of spontaneous. It just occurs that way all these things that love water are always near it and they can interact with the polar water, whereas the parts that dislike water, the hydrophobic areas, are always away from water. This keeps things in or out because things that are hydrophobic or things that, you know, non-polar substances can get through very easily if they're small. So small, non-charged particles can pass easily. But if something is hydrophilic or if something is polar in nature, once it gets part of the way through, it's going to get about halfway down and be kicked out. So that's where that selectively permeability comes into play. So what passes through? So again, due to the tight association of those phospholipids, only certain things can make it through the cell membrane without assistances. So things that can pass through easily are small, uncharged molecules like gases, mainly carbon dioxide, oxygen, things like that, if we're thinking about something that's going to go through cell respiration. Right? Substances that cannot pass through are things that are large or things that are charged. So does that mean that these things can't get through at all, ever? Of course not. They can get through, they just can't pass through the cell membrane on their own. They have to find an alternate route, as in a channel protein or carrier protein or a pump of some sort. So what's going to cause something to want to get through in the first place? Well, that's called a concentration gradient. So that's a difference in concentration from one side to another. So you can see here in the picture, there's a higher concentration of red dots on this side versus this side. So the arrows, arrows show you that things are going to move from a high to a low concentration. When are they going to stop moving from one side to the other? Well, that's going to be whenever there's the same number of red dots on both sides. So we have a name for this, and it's called diffusion. You can see the same thing here with the purple dots. Imagine someone in the back corner of the room lights a scented lavender candle. <clears throat> Excuse me. Lights a scented lavender candle. Well, just like what you saw here, when they first come through, there's a higher concentration in that corner of the room. Well, as time goes on, that's going to diffuse from that high concentration in the corner of the room to the lower concentrations at first, everywhere else throughout. So eventually, that scent is all throughout the room, that aroma. And it may not be as strong as it is right by the candle, but it's because those, I guess, scent particles or whatever they are, the lavender aromas, spread out throughout the room. So again, which way does diffusion go? Diffusion goes from high to low. When does it stop? When there's an equal concentration throughout. See all these are evenly spaced? We call this passive transport because no energy is required. Things move from high to low on their own in nature just because nature seeks balance. We call that an equilibrium. 
So the diffusion of water is known as osmosis. It has a special name, osmosis, because water, albeit polar, so it shouldn't be able to move through, it can because it's very, 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 very tiny. So that allows it this special property to diffuse from one side to another. So the diffusion of water from high concentration to low is known as osmosis. If it goes across a selectively permeable membrane, these membranes are letting water through, but not these bigger, larger red sugar molecules. You can notice that at the start here, there's more sugar than there is water. There's more water than there is here on the other side. So water is going to go to the left. So you can see the water level rises over here than it does here. This is similar to when you get a drink from a fast food place. You might have a lot of ice in that cup and another cup has less ice. Well, there's actually a different amount of soda in both cups, even though they start out looking like they're at the same level. So as water moves from one side to the other, that water level will rise because these extra sugar particles, they take up room too. Here's another thing. You can see the blue water molecules are going through very easily, whereas the green ones are bouncing off that selectively permeable membrane or barrier. So some people like to talk about slugs. You guys ever put salt on a slug? Adding salt creates a gradient, as in all of a sudden there's less water outside than there is inside. So if there's less outside and inside, water comes from the inside to the outside, and you can see these things shrivel up. So it's kind of nasty. So solutions. Solutions have different parts. It's basically it's a substance that's dissolved in a liquid. For the purposes of our class, a liquid's going to be water, but it could be other liquids that things can be dissolved in as well. The example we're going to talk about is Kool-Aid. Right? The solvent is that liquid base of the solution. So if you're making Kool-Aid, if you're making sweet tea, the water itself is the solvent. The solute is what gets dissolved in there. So for Kool-Aid, it'd be your red powder or your sugar. You know, there's blue powder, purple powder, whatever type of Kool-Aid you want. But the stuff that gets dissolved is the actual solute. The thing that's doing the dissolving is the solvent. For sweet tea, the water would be the solvent. And then maybe the tea bag or whatever you're using, tea leaves, if you're going, you know, fancy or whatnot. And there's a whole bunch of sugar to make it sweet tea. All right, that's going to be your solute. All right, so let's talk about concentration of water one more time. The direction of osmosis, you can actually predict it because you can, do, you can determine the amount of solute concentrations easier than you can solute or solvent concentrations. So here on the left, this is hypotonic, right? Hypotonic means there's less solute, so less little particles, and more solvent, so more water. Whereas on the right, there's more particles, so more solute, but less solvent. So which way is water going to go? Well, remember, water goes from high to low concentrations. So it should go from left to right, because even though they're the same level now, there's more water over here than there is here, because this has more space being taken up by these little yellow particles, sugar or something. So when are they going to stop moving? Whenever the two solutions are isotonic to one another, isotonic meaning equal. So what's going to happen here? Inside the cell, there's 20% salt, which means there's 80% water. Outside, there's 5% salt, which means there's 95% water. So sure enough, there's more water outside than there is inside. 95% out, only 80% in. Water should move in to this cell. And we're actually going to do a lab in the future here very shortly where we make our own cells and put them in different types of solution. We're going to see what diffuses through. So different examples here. Cells have to manage or regulate they call that osmotic regulation, if too much water or not enough is getting in. So we can talk about that at a future date. Facilitated diffusion. Things can still get through passively, meaning without energy, they just need help. So I think facilitate means to help. So you might see a carrier protein or a channel protein. These things still want to go from high to low concentration, but they're too big or some, maybe they're charged. They can't get through either side of this protein through the actual phospholipid bilayer, they have to find a specific channel protein that's going to let that in. This thing may let them in, but not some other ion or particle. Channels move specific molecules across the cell membrane. So you think of it as, wow, I really want to get across this creek, but I have to take a bridge to get across. So you can only have one way across. And you can live through large or charged particles. So like we said earlier, these things can still get in. They just can't, you know, get in through that actual lipid bilayer. They have to find another way to passively diffuse across the membrane as they need help, hence facilitated diffusion. So no energy is required. It's still an example of passive transport. As you might imagine, active transport is the opposite. All right? You do need energy. So why would you need energy for active transport? 
Very good. If passive is high to low concentration, nature takes care of that on its own. It wants to happen on its own. Active transport is when you go from low to high. So maybe something keeps leaving the cell. We want to pump it back in. We need more of it than you know, an equal amount. We want more of it inside. We're going to pump it into the cell. Or maybe we want to pump a poison or something like that out of the cell, right, from low to high concentration. To do that, again, it's specific. You have one shape, one protein per type of particle or molecule or ion you want in or out. Example, one famous example would be their sodium potassium pump. We'll talk about an NAK pump later. But this thing will go into here. It has a ATP or adenosine triphosphate. That's an energy. It phosphorylizes or something like that. It hydrolyzes ATP. When that happens, it's going to go into that. It's going to have a conformational change, which means the actual protein itself changes shape. So this comes from opening this way. Once you have ATP, it now opens this way and it lets this thing you know, kind of float through to the other side. So again, active transport is when you're moving against the concentration gradient. We call these protein pumps for that matter. Think of like a bilge pump in a boat. If you've got water coming in, you're going to use a bilge pump to pump water out. So let's overview. You've got passive transport. There's more than one kind. There's simple diffusion, which is where small, nonpolar things can make their way through. There's facilitated diffusion, where things still go from high to low concentration, but facilitated diffusion, they need help. And that help comes in the uh, form of a protein channel or a carrier or transport protein. Active transport, then, is when you're going against the concentration gradient, or you're going from low to high concentration. This requires energy. Think it's really easy to slide down a slide, but going up a slide, it takes a little more energy. You have to actually use energy and climb up there. So active transport is when you're going against the concentration gradient. You can think of passive transport as getting on a raft or canoe and going downstream very easily. All you're really doing is steering. The current takes you, the concentration gradient takes you on its own. Whereas active transport, you got to turn around, paddle against the current, and if that's happening, it takes a lot more energy. You're going against the concentration gradient. So summary, you've got simple diffusion here on top. Thing is, you're going from high to low concentration directly through the membrane. You've got facilitated diffusion. Again, both these are passive transport. Still going from high to low, but these things can't make it through. They need a channel protein. Here you've got active transport going from low to high concentration. This requires energy, ATP. Is there any questions? What you see here is a, um, a protein pump. So this requires ATP. These things come in, conformational change, goes through the other side, from outside to inside. Fun stuff.